Thank you, Terry, for that kind introduction. Uh, it did begin, as Terry said, with my birthday on Lincoln's birthday in Chicago, in Illinois, in Lincoln country. And uh, when I started collecting Lincoln materials obsessively when I was 10 years old, uh, that's when this madness began. And a few years ago when Manhunt was published, my father said, thank goodness your mother and I did not have you on Grover Cleveland's birthday. <laughs> or even worse, and, and my father's a great buff of the Second World War, he said, thank God we didn't have you on Hitler's birthday. What would you have ended up studying and, and becoming obsessed with? But it's a great pleasure to be back at the Abraham Lincoln Institute. I have so many friends here and colleagues. It's always a pleasure to be among you again. And I see in the audience uh, several special friends that I really must acknowledge. Uh, in Japan, there's a concept of, of a living treasure, of a human being who's a national treasure, treasure, as much as a work of art, a painting, a symphony. Uh, by their very existence, these people enrich our lives. And when I was a teenager growing up in Chicago, I came to Washington for the first time to visit the National Archives, where I met Mike Music, who showed me Lincoln assassination reward posters and guided me through the Lincoln assassination records when I was 17 years old. And I've always remembered his kindness and courtesies to me. Years ago, when I began working on my books, I came to the Library of Congress, where I met two other living treasures who are also with us today, Clark Evans in the Rare Book Room and John Sellers in Manuscripts. And their expertise and good cheer and friendship have been invaluable to me. Sadly, of these three men, two have retired from full-time active service in our common cause. And so, Clark, it's been decided that you will never be allowed to retire from federal <laughs> service. Uh, we can call you anytime we want, and you'll help us find the rare books and treasures we need uh, to continue our research. But I did want to acknowledge uh, these three great Americans and scholars for the help that they've really given to all of us over the last year. <laughs> After I had written Manhunt, I thought I had finished with the Lincoln assassination, and I was looking on uh, other topics. But something about the book haunted me, and, and there was some of it still in me. And I realized this on a few different occasions. Uh, one was at events like this, when readers would say, well, what are you doing next? Or you mention in a paragraph that there's another manhunt going on for Jefferson Davis. What happened with that? You mention in a sentence the funeral pageant for Abraham Lincoln on the day that Booth was killed. And I started to get more and more interested in those things. And then uh, my boys, who are now 12 and 14, uh, and who are my main critics, and who helped me with my children's books and advise me, uh, said, we want to know more. What happened with the Lincoln funeral? Tell us about the embalming, the autopsy, the funeral pageant. And they always uh, want the blood and gore. In fact, uh, I said, well, what should I do next? And, and uh, the older boy said, readers want blood. <laughs> and, and the younger one said, and knives. <laughs> and uh, there aren't quite as many of those in this book. But... Uh, it's important to me when I do a book to visit the places where history happened. And those of you who have read Manhunt know that I visited Ford's Theater a hundred times while I was working on that book. I would often go there during my lunch hour and sit and think and look at the space. Or I'd go to the Peterson House and often could be alone in the room where Abraham Lincoln died. And I've been in the White House in the, in the Lincoln bedroom and in other places. And a sense of place is what brings history alive for me. And having the original things in front of me or in my hands is what brought history alive to me and still does. And so one day I was walking through Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown. And those who haven't been there must go. Uh, Secretary of War Stanton, Lincoln's great right hand, and so many other important Americans are buried there. And I remember one day walking for the first time to visit the tomb of Willie Lincoln. And... Uh, Willie was not taken to Springfield at once. He was entombed temporarily in a vault that belonged to the clerk of the U.S. Supreme Court at the very far end of the cemetery. And if you don't know where it is, it's almost impossible to find. And I remember going to Willie's tomb and remembering that Jefferson Davis's son had also been buried in that same cemetery 
And as I walked to the tomb of the Lincoln boy, I realized I had to almost step across where once was the grave of Jefferson Davis's infant son. And that juxtaposition of these two dead boys, of the two fallen presidents, struck me as deeply moving. And I realized how little I truly knew about Jefferson Davis and his story. And so I decided to investigate it the way I would do a Lincoln story, by visiting the places, holding the artifacts, going to the Museum of the Confederacy, visiting the spot where one of Davis's other sons died during the Civil War, uh, visiting his office, uh, viewing the flag that once draped his coffin, viewing the clothing he wore during his escape. And that really made history come alive for me. And I realized I didn't fully understand the Lincoln story until I started to research and understand the story of his counterpart. And if you visited the White House to learn about Lincoln, I, I've now concluded you have to go to the Museum of the Confederacy. You have to go to the Confederate White House and visit there. And so that's really how I began doing this story. And it was a great pleasure to do. Uh, after I do a book, I like to think about what did I learn, what did I not expect to see. And to my great delight, I met a great variety of characters. Burton Harrison, Davis's private secretary. Constance Carey, uh, his lovely fiance, who left incredible letters and diary entries about the Davises and about life in Richmond during the war. A woman I had never heard of before, Eliza Andrews, a young woman in Georgia who saw Davis pass through her town uh, during his escape and she wrote wonderful things in her diary. And so many other people, the cabinet members who accompanied Davis, <laughs> Lubbock, the former governor of Texas, Reagan, the treasury secretary, great characters. And by the time I'd finished my research, I came to what I thought was a surprising conclusion as a Lincoln man. Jefferson Davis is truly one of the lost men of American history. And I think it's a loss to us that we don't know who he is anymore. Who remembers him, aside from perhaps his birthday? Even that. We celebrated recently the 200th anniversary of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. White House dinners, stamps, coins, television documentaries, films, celebrations, lectures, symposiums, over 75 books published for the occasion. In 2008, the bicentennial of the birth of Jefferson Davis passed without notice. Uh, there were no White House dinners, no coins, no stamps, no books. And the interesting thing is, prior to Abraham Lincoln's inauguration in 1861, it was Jefferson Davis and not Abraham Lincoln who many of Americans would have identified as a likely future president of the United States. Certainly, if, say, as late as 1855, maybe even 1856, a few years before the Lincoln-Douglas debates. If you had said to most Americans, and put aside political issues of, of old Whig or Republican or Democrat, and, and not ask people their desire, but simply to make a prediction. If you had said to most Americans prior to 1856, who was a likely future president of the United States of America? Jefferson Davis or Abraham Lincoln? I'm convinced that a number of people would have said, Abraham who? certainly prior to 1855. It was Davis who was once perceived as the great American, graduate of West Point, congressman, hero of the Mexican War who led his troops forward in battle, was wounded but continued the fight, United States Senator, one of our greatest secretaries of war, and a man renowned for his nationalism and patriotism. A man who once said, I believe that the North, with its great industry, and the South, with our agriculture, will conquer the continent. A man who went on long, arduous journeys across the nation on horseback, on frozen river, over difficult terrain, arid deserts. A man who traveled often to the North, who loved the North, who had Northern political friends, and gave important speeches there. A great orator of the Senate. Look at those credentials and imagine a man with those credentials was running for the presidency in the fall of 1860, and his opponent had the following credentials. A graduate of the first grade, 
who did know how to read and write, a man from a rural, humble background with no important friends, no mentors to take him through life or send him to great schools, a man who really had to teach himself and read and studied on his own and read books, a man who never made great journeys across the American continent, a man who had seen very little of America, a man who held no important public office nationally but for one term as a U.S. congressman, which was not an illustrious term. Compare those two credentials, and one wonders if the Democratic Party had not split in 1860, and the election was Davis of Mississippi versus Lincoln of Illinois, what might have happened? Interesting to speculate, we'll never know. Of course, there are so many similarities between them, and this is one of the most fascinating things to me about my research. Uh, we think of them as so different, but think of just a few, and I'll just give a few examples now. Both born in Kentucky, less than one year apart, less than 100 miles apart, both born in log cabins. In their youth, both men were joyful pranksters. They weren't dour, dark figures, brooding men. They were joyful boys. Lincoln, of course, became a fantastic wrestler, and we all know about those matches with the Clary's Grove boys and others. Uh, slaves taught Jefferson Davis to write when he was a boy. Look at their physical similarities. Tall, lean, hawk-like men. Lincoln was the taller man at six foot four. Uh, the erect bearing that Davis learned at West Point stayed with him through much of his life, and he always appeared taller than he was. But they looked almost cadaverous. They weren't interested in fine food, antiques, fine art. They were more interested in the life of the mind. But they both had that haunted look. They both suffered great tragedies in their youth, which I'm, which I'm convinced marked both men in ways that are still not fully understood by us today. In the case of Abraham Lincoln, we know the name Ann Rutledge, and I'm absolutely convinced, and I don't claim the pioneering research on that, that really belongs to our friend Michael Burlingame, who's here with us today in his peerless Lincoln biography. Um, Michael Burlingame has really blown the cover off the Ann Rutledge story. He did love her. They did have a close bond. Who knows if they were to marry? But the villagers saw and they remembered the walks, the talks, the companionship. We have at the Library of Congress that book of grammar inscribed in Abraham Lincoln's hand. Ann Rutledge is now learning grammar. Lincoln was no doubt teaching her to read and write. And her death in the early 1830s, we know, crushed Lincoln. We know that his friends and associates feared that he might take his own life, that his mind might become unhinged. Uh, for 150 years, uh, the influence of Mary Lincoln, Mary Lincoln's apologists, uh, has really concealed much of the story of Abraham Lincoln and Ann Rutledge, much of which we'll never know. Suffice it to say, the death of this young girl on the Illinois frontier was an absolutely devastating event in the life of young Abraham Lincoln. We have no image of her. Who would have thought to paint a portrait or, or do a watercolor or a sketch of a poor, illiterate girl in the West? In the case of Jefferson Davis, her name was Sarah Knox Taylor. She was the daughter of General Zachary Taylor, the future president of the United States. She and Jeff met, and the Taylors were not thrilled with this match. Uh, Mrs. Taylor knew the hard life that an army officer's wife would experience on the western frontier. Jeff and Knox corresponded for two years, didn't see each other. They wrote what Jefferson Davis hints at later in his life were beautiful letters that he never forgot for the next half century. He resigned from the army to marry her, and so they did. He took her home to Mississippi during the sixth season where there was a particularly virulent form of malaria brought over by slaves 200 years before, and then to his sister's plantation, where Jeff and Knox both contracted malaria. Both almost died. He roused himself from bed when he heard her singing one of her favorite songs, and he went to her bed, and uh, Sarah Knox Taylor died in his arms. Uh, 
she was 21, and they had been married for 12 weeks. Davis then went into what he called his period of my, quote, great seclusion, close quote, where for several years he essentially hid himself away on his plantation, which adjoined his brother's plantation. And there he spent the next several years reading, thinking with his brother and their slaves. He eventually emerged from that seclusion to walk in the world again when he married uh, Verena Davis, a uh, great match for him. Certainly in marriage, uh, Lincoln and Jefferson Davis uh, were not equally lucky. Um, Davis was lucky to find Verena, and she was a wonderful companion to him. Uh, her book is wonderful. Her letters are wonderful. Uh, some modern historians have suffered from, I think, modern interpretation and have accused Verena of suffering from a false consciousness and denying her intellectual essence by serving Davis. But if you read the relationship closely, I think they both viewed each other as a lifelong love match. Uh, during the Rocky Road, they lived together. Both men served in the Black Hawk War in entirely different positions. Lincoln is a lowly elected officer in a volunteer company. Davis is a regular army officer who was given the great honor of escorting the captured Black Hawk. And when Black Hawk was caged and chained and uh, whites came to taunt him in his captivity, Davis rebuked them for their shame and Black Hawk praised Davis for his honor. Both read a great deal. Davis had a wonderful private library that he shared with his brother. Lincoln, not so much, but he read whatever he could. We know he read the Bible, Shakespeare, American history, our founding documents, the Constitution, the Declaration. Both were charismatic men for different reasons. Uh, if you met them, you never forgot what they looked like. Abraham Lincoln knew he was not an attractive man, but Abraham Lincoln sensed he was an unforgettable man. And that once you met him, you would not forget his appearance. Uh, he was fascinated with photography. He posed for over 135 photographs as president. He was interested in his political image making. Davis, the same. If you met him, you would remember him. There were great speakers for entirely opposite reasons. Lincoln had this high, keening Kentucky accent that could reach great distances. He could warm up, and he was mesmerizing. Davis, on the other hand, who caused people to cry in his farewell speech when he left the Senate, had a pleasing Southern voice. It was that voice that charmed Knox and later Verena on the day they met. During their presidencies, both were tortured and bedeviled by their critics. Lincoln, as we all know, was despised by a number of people in the North. He was despised by a set of newspaper editors. People despised him for the draft. People despised him for fighting the war in the first place. Davis was equally bedeviled by generals and cabinet members who defied him, who sought to undermine him, who dreamed of replacing him. Uh, both knew throughout their presidencies that they suffered from major opposition. Both had White House tragedies. In February 1862, Lincoln's favorite son, Willie, died after an illness of several weeks. This truly crushed Lincoln. Of, of all of his sons, I think Willie was the favorite. He was most like Lincoln physically, in movement, in walking, in method of reasoning. Uh, he was a special child, and his death crushed Lincoln. Davis had a boy who fell to his death from the White House balcony in Richmond in 1864. Davis rushed home from his presidential office. The boy was still living. There was only enough time for him to cradle his little son in his arms, and the boy died. Davis went upstairs, and while the, the elite of the Confederacy came to him that night, he wouldn't come down. Uh, he could be heard pacing the floor. And one wonders if, if the death of his son threw him back 30 years to that night when his wife of 12 weeks also died in his arms. They were both sad and mysterious men marked by some of these tragedies that they had suffered. Both men ultimately rejected compromise. Both men had great strength of will. Both men, when they believed they were right, 
would not compromise. Abraham Lincoln has come down in myth as a great negotiator, a great compromise, a man who always sought the middle ground, a man who wanted to get along. Uh, that's in fact not true. When Abraham Lincoln was absolutely convinced that the principle he was standing for was right, he wouldn't yield. Which is why, of course, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis became the two greatest killers in American history. 620,000 dead because both men and both causes believed they were right and would not yield. And during the Civil War, both men laid their heads on their pillows each night less than 100 miles apart, dreaming of ruining each other's empire. Of course, there were great differences between them. In empathy and temperament, they were quite different men. Abraham Lincoln empathized with other people. He could put himself in the position of others, feel what they felt, get a sense of what they wanted. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was essentially an amateur psychologist or psychiatrist. During those two decades of law practice in Illinois, Lincoln heard tens of thousands of cases, met clients, wrote briefs, saw other lawyers try cases. Abraham Lincoln was a debt collector. Almost half of his law practice was collections, not great constitutional issues. He defended liars, murderers, prostitutes, slanderers, thieves, reprobates. Lincoln experienced the heights and depths that man can know. And he became a great reader of the human mind. And while Lincoln knew he was different from other men, and Lincoln do, knew he had certain gifts that others did not possess, he did act humbly. And he would not hold a man's high opinion of himself against him, as, as we witnessed when he assembled his cabinet. Lincoln was more flexible in dealing with allies and even with foes. Jeff Davis's great Achilles heel was his inflexibility and his more sober personality. He could take offense easier than Lincoln could take offense. He could hold a grudge longer than Abraham Lincoln could hold a grudge. And that certainly undermined part of his presidency. Of course, the ultimate difference between them is, is and this is the great divide. You know, people always ask, did they ever meet? Did they know each other? Were they friends in Congress before the Civil War? No, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis never met. Apparently, they never even laid eyes on each other even though for certain brief periods of time they lived in Washington during the same months. Here is the great divide between them. Who is man? What is the nature of man? Jefferson Davis believed that African Americans were by their very nature inferior and meant to be slaves. He believed that slavery was actually good for them, that it civilized a primitive people from Africa, that it Christianized them. And Davis believed that it was the natural order of things that one race be superior and in control of another race. And of course, as Abraham Lincoln said once, but believed throughout his life, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. That, in a nutshell, was Lincoln's view. Lincoln believed that people could be improved. He believed that they must be free. He believed that people should all be free under the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Lincoln never believed in equality of result, but Lincoln believed in equality under the law. Everyone having the same opportunity to be free, to work, to marry, to live where they wished, and not to be another man's property. It's for that reason, I think, if Lincoln and Davis did know each other, they could have never been friends in the end. They could have never compromised on those two vitally different views of the very nature of man. They had other things in common, too. Both became greater martyrs to their cause after they fell from power than when they held power. We already know how, how controversial their presidencies were, how many opponents they had in their own countries, let alone in the opposing countries. But when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he enjoyed the greatest martyrdom in American history. And the apotheosis after his death, which occurred during the deathbed vigil 
on April 14th and April 15th, 1865, which occurred during the embalming and autopsy of the president in the White House guest room. One of the saddest scenes I've ever read about in, in my writing career. The funeral in the East Room, the procession down Pennsylvania Avenue, and then that long railroad journey home to Springfield, the 1600 mile journey. I won't dwell on the details of that journey. It's so laid out in the book. But I will say that I think it's the most moving, emotionally stunning public event in American history. And I say that bearing in mind uh, the funeral of President Kennedy, September 11th. Uh, imagine those events and how you felt if you were alive on either of those days. Intensify those feelings many times, and that's how America felt when Abraham Lincoln's body went home. Because, of course, it wasn't Abraham Lincoln's corpse alone coming home on that journey. In a way, it was every son, every father, every brother, every lover, every husband who was lost in that war coming home with Lincoln on that train. And that's why that event had such great emotional impact. In the case of Jefferson Davis, his final journey took a different trajectory. He fled Richmond. Lee said the army can't hold back Grant anymore. And so Davis and his cabinet fled on train. It was not a run to save his life. If Davis wanted to merely save his skin, he could have escaped the country like other members of his cabinet did. But he felt he had a higher duty to serve the cause. And he said, as long as any man is willing to fight, I shall lead him and I will not flee. And so the final history of the Confederacy is a, is a series of retreating events from one temporary capital to another as Davis tries to stay in contact with Lee and then Lee surrenders. And then Davis tries to rally Joe Johnston to fight on in North Carolina. And then Johnston surrenders. And then his bodyguard and entourage shrinks in size until at the very end, when he knows the cause is lost, he, his wife, his children, and a few dozen men are surrounded by Union forces on May 10th, 1865 in Georgia. Uh, an interesting day because he so could easily have died that way, the way John Wilkes Booth was shot down. Many wanted to hang Davis. No one knew what to do with him. He was imprisoned for two years. Many thought he'd be tried for the murder of Abraham Lincoln, but it turned out witnesses who wanted to testify to that were perjurers, and there was actually no evidence that Jefferson Davis had any knowledge or participation in the plot to kill Abraham Lincoln, and of that I am convinced uh, he was not involved. But if we let him go for that, why not try him for treason and hang him? He led a secessionist rebellion that caused the death of hundreds of thousands of Americans. Uh, surely he must die, said a number of the newspapers. Well, an interesting dilemma occurred. If Jefferson Davis is put on trial for treason, which the Constitution says would occur in the city of Washington, D.C., which was a stronghold of Southern sympathy and secessionism throughout the war, what would happen if Davis was actually acquitted? Charles D. O'Connor, one of the greatest lawyers in America from New York, offered to defend him, as did other men. Important abolitionists would later uh, pay his bond. We can't have him tried and acquitted because that means secession was right. Davis was right. We've just wasted 300,000 Union lives for nothing, and they were right all along. On the other hand, some realized that Lincoln was right. If we try Jefferson Davis and hang him, it'll create a martyr. The Springfield Republican newspaper said, a million Southern women will come to dip their handkerchiefs in his blood and they will fight us for another century. Ultimately, Lincoln's view prevailed. Lincoln didn't want punishment. When Lincoln went to Richmond and visited Davis's house and a Union general said, what shall we do with these rebels? Lincoln said, let them up easy, let them up easy. It was one of Abraham Lincoln's greatest moments. And ultimately, that view prevailed. He must not be killed. The Southern leaders must not be killed. They must be set free. And so two years after his capture, Davis was freed. Uh, his bail was paid among, by, among other people, Horace Greeley and Garrett Smith, the great abolitionist, one of the secret six. When Smith was accused of hypocrisy for bailing out the slave master Davis, uh, Smith had something interesting to say. He said, uh, slavery, and I'm paraphrasing now, 
slavery is not the crime of the South. Slavery is the crime of the North and the South. The Civil War is not the fault of the South. The Civil War is the fault of the North and the South. And so this great abolitionist helped pay the bail bond for Jefferson Davis. Davis then lived an afterlife of 24 years. He lived on almost a quarter century after the death of Abraham Lincoln. He was a lost man then. He didn't know what to do. He wouldn't take charity from Confederates because he said, my nation is poor, my people are impoverished, I will accept nothing. It would be dishonorable. His presidency of an insurance company failed during a great illness in the South when half of Memphis died and massive insurance claims had to be paid. Jefferson Davis found his mission in life upon the death of Robert E. Lee. Lee had planned to write his memoirs, but he died before he could. And Davis wrote to Burton Harrison, it occurs to me before I am pulled into the grave, I might write a history of the struggle of our people. He became the leader of the Confederate memory. He sponsored historical societies. He wrote letters, he received visitors, he talked about the war. And he became the living link between the Confederate dead and the Confederate living. And at that time, the Confederate dead was often spelled with a capital C and a capital D. It was the view that this invisible army of hundreds of thousands of dead Southern men and boys was somehow hovering over or watching over the South. And Davis became their spokesman. And I'd like to close with the climax of this. Here's Davis, he's lived on more than 20 years. He's finally found his mission. Southerners now love him more than they ever did when he was at the height of his power. His imprisonment has transformed him into a martyr in the Southern mind. He was shackled and manacled briefly and that caused a phrase to reverberate throughout the South. He suffered for us. And so he's near the end of his life. He's written his memoirs. He thinks he's gonna die soon and he receives an invitation to come south and dedicate a memorial to the Confederate war dead in Alabama. And I'd like to read just a few words of what he said because this was his apotheosis. I'm convinced that this was the most important public speech Jefferson Davis ever gave because it cemented the image of him in the Southern mind. Now he's come to Alabama. He realizes that something is happening. He takes the train from Beauvoir, his retreat, and he sees people at railroad stations. When he arrives, he sees thousands of people waiting for him, and he realizes, this is not what I expected, what, what's happening? Tens of thousands of people come to hear him speak, and this is what he says. You have passed through the terrible ordeal of a war which Alabama did not seek, a holy war. Well do I remember seeing your gentle boys, so small, to use a farmer's phrase, they might have been called the seed corn. Moving on with eager step and fearless brow to the carnival of death. And I have also looked upon them when their knapsacks and the muskets seemed heavier than the boys. And my eyes, partaking of a mother's weakness, filled with tears. Those days have passed. Many of them have found nameless graves. That poetic image of the seed corn was driving the audience almost to a frenzy. And then Davis uttered the words that I think linked him forever, uh, united the Confederate past and present through this dream of the lost cause. But they are not dead. They live in memory, and their spirits stand out in a grand reserve of that column which is marching on with unfaltering steps towards the goal of constitutional liberty. Then, at the conclusion of his speech, he took his listeners back to the very start of the Civil War. I'm now standing very nearly on the spot where I took that oath of office in 1861. Your demonstration now exceeds that which welcomed me then. The spirit of Southern liberty is not dead. Then you were full of joyous hope with the full prospect of achieving all you desired. And now you are wrapped in the mantle of regret. I've been promised, my friends, that I should not be called upon to make a speech. And therefore, I will only extend my heartfelt thanks. God bless you one and all, men and boys, and ladies above all the others who never faltered in our direst need. Davis then sat down, and the New York Times and other reporters said, 
What happened next was unbelievable. They said thousands of people shouted and screamed as they had never seen before. One reporter said, uh, the South is aflame, and no one knows where this will end. Davis went on to other speaking triumphs. Uh, one day when 5,000 Confederate soldiers ran towards the house to greet him, his wife Farina said, they're going to kill you. You can't touch them. Don't let them shake your hands. You're going to die. And Davis said, if I'm to die, I will be happy to die in the presence of my Confederate soldiers. Uh, he died a couple years later in 1889 and was given a funeral in New Orleans. But Verena had already decided New Orleans was not going to be his final resting place. And so, just as in the case of Abraham Lincoln 24 years ago, a funeral train was gotten up. Davis's corpse was put aboard after it was properly photographed for all the South to see. And just like the Lincoln funeral journey, he went from city to city, rolling north to Richmond. Americans held up signs that had some of the identical language that was held up 24 years earlier as Lincoln's corpse passed by. He suffered for us. He lives in the hearts of the people, our president, our hero. And Davis was ultimately laid to rest in Richmond in 1893 where he could reign forever over the dreams of the Confederacy and the lost cause. I began this book as a Lincoln man. And I certainly end it as such. Uh, but I have to say, it's been a fascinating journey to learn the life of Lincoln's counterpart and realize how much they had in common, how different they were, and how we really can't understand the true meaning and importance of the Civil War unless we know the story of the soldiers and the civilians, the story of the men and the women, the story of the whites and the blacks, and certainly, until we know the story of both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, uh, thank you. If anyone had a question, I'd be happy to try to answer it. Uh-oh, Michael Burlingame has James, just gone to the microphone. <laughs> James, thanks for the plug. I really appreciated your kind words. Uh, of all the features of the Lincoln funeral train journey, was the one that really stood out to you as most touching? Uh, yes. Uh, the funeral train was passing a, a part of the track. And what's interesting, aside from these 10 funerals, which a million people came and viewed the corpse. Seven million people stood along tracks all along the way, all hours of the day or night, rainstorms, torches, firing guns. There's one scene where the funeral train is passing by, and General Townsend, who was in charge of the funeral train, looked out his window, and he saw an elderly poor woman. Uh, he said she looked bedraggled, white hair standing out, and she had a black shawl and sash and she was beckoning to the train with a bouquet of flowers. And the image of that sole woman standing by the railroad tracks waiting for the train to pass was very moving to me. I think the most shocking thing, by the way, was what New York City did to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's the only place along the journey where Lincoln's corpse was actually photographed. And if such a thing were to happen today, where would it happen but of course but in New York City? <laughs> <laughs> and the love of the sensational. Uh, and that caused great controversy. But I, I think one of the most moving things with it was that simple story of that woman standing alone, beckoning to the train with a bouquet of flowers that she had picked for Lincoln. And, and another great one is Willie Lincoln traveled aboard the train with his father. And some children sent flowers to the train and presented them for Willie's coffin. And that their message was, so that he is not forgotten to. Uh, Michael. Another Lincoln-related <laughs> question. Uh, I've just been reading the autobiography of John Mercer Langston, a uh, noted African-American lawyer, inspector of the Freedmen's Bureau, congressman, and so forth. Uh, and Langston was in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the time of Lincoln's death. And uh, 
in his memoir, he says that uh, as Lincoln's body was taken to the Capitol, uh, it was removed from the hearse and taken to the catafalque, not by any of the many white Union regiments that were in Washington at the time, but one black regiment that had been brought up from Tidewater was given the honor of taking the body from the hearse to the catafalque, and apparently that electrified Langston. Uh, was that an accurate rec recollection, and do we know what unit that might have been? I know, but not off the top of my head. Uh, some Union officials wanted to keep black soldiers and black citizens from marching in the parade. And Stanton was not pleased to hear that and gave specific orders that black military units were to participate. And there was a moment when that unit of black troops was arriving to join the procession. And the procession was starting to move. So just as they turned onto the avenue, they appeared to almost head the procession like they were beginning a, a, a position of honor, and that caused a great thrill to come through the crowd. But, but how tragic it would have been if at Abraham Lincoln's own funeral, uh, the black troops, of which almost 200,000 had joined the Union Army and many had died, how tragic if they had not been allowed to march in the funeral procession for Lincoln. Great answer, thank you. In your book, you mentioned how Jefferson Davis and his escape finished up with uh, penniless and gave away his last coin to a poor widow. He left uh, Richmond on a train with all the treasures of the Confederacy. What happened to the treasures? Well, I'm not going to answer that question <laughs> because my next project is I'm going to attempt to find the Confederate gold for myself, so I'm not going <laughs> to tell you where it is. Uh, <laughs> well, let me give a brief answer to that. Uh, the Confederate gold train, or trains, I should say, is a whole subject in itself worthy of a whole book in itself. And so for strategic reasons and as a concession to the brevity of life, I decided not to also write the history of the Confederate gold train. Uh, the, the gold comes in and out of my book, but on purpose I excluded the entire legacy of the gold train and the Confederate gold and money uh, because that would be a 300-page book in itself. Uh, suffice it to say, Jefferson Davis's aides had several thousand dollars in gold on their persons when they were captured. Part of that was their personal money, part of it was a remnant of the treasury. But the bulk of the Confederate money was definitely not with Jefferson Davis uh, on May 10, 1865. Some of Davis's cousins were put in charge of some of the gold, and that gold was meant to care for Verena and the children, if Davis were to be killed in action or executed. And those cousins stole the money, and Verena never saw it. Uh, that's just one of the stories. There are many stories how the money was split up, where it went, uh, but I just decided that couldn't be the focus of the book, because that's really a second book. And I do want to find it, so I wouldn't tell you anyway. <laughs> yeah. First, I compliment you on a moving presentation. It Thank was you. unbiased, and it seemed to give us the two sides of the story. My question, early on, you mentioned going to Georgetown to Willie's grave and stepping across, I believe what you said was where Davis's son had been yes. buried. Could you uh, elaborate how did the boy who, did he fall to his death in Richmond, end up in a Georgetown. Oh, uh, it's uh, a different boy. When Davis was serving the United States government in Washington. As a senator. His infant son uh, died of illness. And that boy was buried in Washington. And then after Davis died, and after he was ultimately buried in Richmond, uh, the body of that boy uh, was removed from Washington, D.C. and taken to Richmond. But all through the Civil War, uh, a son of Jefferson Davis was buried at Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown. And it's a different boy, an older boy, who died in the Confederate White House when he fell to his death from the uh, second floor porch or, or balcony. Thank you. Yes. You've already compared the uh, merits of the two in military matters uh, with um, um, Davis uh, beginning as a West Point graduate and a war hero and 
becoming a Secretary of War, Senator, concerned with military matters, and Lincoln, who, whose uh, uh, most intrepid flo uh, foe were the uh, infe insects that he encountered by his own uh, mm -hmm. uh, admission along the trail. Uh, one having uh, uh, an impeccable uh, pedigree for someone to be a war president, and the other uh, not so much so. So would you compare them as actual military uh, leaders? Yes, I will. Interesting question, because oftentimes in American politics today, people are outraged that, that certain presidents, whether it's Republican or Democrat, we've heard the claims, he's not qualified to be president. Uh, he didn't do this or he didn't do that. He's not the smartest person. He wasn't in the Senate long enough. You know, he, he didn't do enough national achievement after someone, he's, someone in his family was president before him. You hear these accusations implying that the presidency is supposed to go to the smartest kid in the room or the student government president. Uh, and that might lead to Woodrow Wilson or Jimmy Carter. Uh, I'll say no more about that. <laughs> but, but you're right about the training. Uh, beginning of the war, Abraham Lincoln was not a good military leader. And I think if Lincoln was here today, he would say, you know what, during that first year of that war, I let the generals bamboozle me too much. Uh, but he had an incredible reasoning ability. One of my favorite stories is the story about the, the Union troops creating a, a lock or a passageway for a, a vessel to, to travel through. And they go through all the elaborate preparations, and of course McClellan is the great preparer, not the fighter, but the preparer. And this is built, and then the boat can't go through. And Lincoln said something like, and I'm paraphrasing again, it would occur to me that if I were to design a passageway for a vessel, I might measure the width of the vessel, <laughs> and then measure the passageway. And, and so, uh, Lincoln had an intuitive grasp of logical, common sense things. And then he, he developed a great grasp that the mission was to crush the Confederate Army, not to capture cities and, and places of, of emotional significance, but to grind it out and win. Uh, Davis didn't want to be president. He thought he should be general or general in chief of the Confederate armies, and he didn't think he'd be necessarily a great war leader. Uh, I suppose you could say Lincoln was certainly the more effective war leader, but he also had more to work with. Uh, is it a miracle that the Confederacy didn't win, or is it a miracle that they were able to actually last for four years? Uh, Davis gave it all. Uh, Robert E. Lee said, and I think this is a telling tale because they did have a good relationship, Robert E. Lee said, no man could have done better. Uh, if Lincoln was president of the Confederacy, could he have won the war with the resources Davis had? I don't know. If Davis had the resources Lincoln had, could he have won the Civil War? Uh, in the end, though, I think Lincoln did show less jealousy. He showed more flexibility and less grudge as a war leader than Davis did. And sometimes Davis's personality impaired his military judgment, or he stuck too long with generals who he viewed as loyal allies when perhaps he should have replaced them. So if it came down to it, the coin flip, I'd flip the coin for Lincoln to, to, to win in that category. Yes. Yes, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I know that the funeral train took his in Lincoln's inaugural, inaugural trip backwards, back to Spring Springfield. Approximately, yes. Yeah, well, that's my question. Uh, I know Pittsburgh is one of the cities that was uh, left off the yes. final trip. Do you know why? Well, it was simply a matter of time. The Secretary of War was deluged with telegrams from all over the North. Please send him here. Uh, detour the train there. Go to Missouri and St. Louis, then come to Springfield. Everyone wanted to see him, especially in every city where Lincoln had passed through during the 1861 inaugural journey coming east. And I've, I've read most of the telegrams that were sent from, by governors and political leaders and generals begging Stanton, please send him this way. They'd even try to get to Mary Lincoln. You know, Send him here. We love him here. And it just became a matter of time. And Lincoln couldn't keep, be kept on the road forever. Uh, embalming was used during the war, but it was primitive. Abraham Lincoln lay unburied for 20 days. And he did begin to decompose on the journey. It couldn't go on forever. Uh, newspapers were polite about it and didn't exactly mention the appearance of the corpse as the journey progressed. But undertakers had to be on board the train attending to it constantly. 
And it was really not to slight any particular region of the country. It was really the ticking clock of getting that body home to Springfield in a reasonable amount of time. And so it was really for logistical reasons, organizational reasons, not to, to slight any particular city or any state. Uh, Lincoln just couldn't be taken everywhere that the people begged that he come. Yeah, I know, but they were big Lincoln supporters there, so it's kind of surprising that Pittsburgh was left off the, the list. But thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I'm just wondering, what is your most, what was the most interesting document you had ever seen here at the National Archives? Well, uh, it's a tough question because for much of my research, I've been more of a Library of Congress man and a U.S. Army Medical Museum man. Uh, much of my work at the archives has been done from microfilm, and the archives is very reluctant to let historians see original things. So I'd say at the archives, nothing of great significance. I would say at the Library of Congress and the U.S. Army Medical Museum, where, for example, I've held in my hands the piece of John Wilkes Booth's spine, pierced by Boston Corbett's bullet, uh, where at the, at the Library of Congress, where I've looked at, this is probably the most exciting thing. Uh, one day, John Sellers and I, looked at the original diary of Benjamin Brown French, uh, who was commissioner of public buildings in Washington, D.C., lifelong Washingtonian, knew everyone, saw everything, beautifully bound volumes, beautiful script and handwriting, color objects inserted in drawings and ephemera, and those are the kinds of things you can't pick up just through a black and white microfilm or, or a scan. Uh, the Civil War came alive that day when John and I were looking through that diary of, of his incredible participation in the Lincoln funeral, uh, the mourning, the grand march of the Union armies, uh, one of the great unsung observers of, of 19th century American history in Washington, D.C. Is, is Benjamin Brown French. So I, I would say uh, that's probably the favorite document uh, during my research. Uh, that I've seen in person. Thanks very much. I have a question. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes, I have a question. I was wondering if there are, um, is there artwork of the funeral? Oh yes, there's a lot. One thing I tried to do in the book, I think history books in general don't show enough photographs. Uh, I'm, I'm very much an image person, and so I, I fought a few battles with my publisher, and instead of the usual 20 or 30 images, I think we, we've stuffed over 60 or 65 images into this book, many of which have not been published before. Uh, so I'd certainly start with this book. Uh, I did a book entirely on images related to the Lincoln assassination. I think there are over 200 images there, uh, and there are a couple other books on the subject, too. Uh, so that, that's what I'd say about where to go next for, for the imagery. Thank you.